Okay, so today's uh, lecture is about um, exercises on induction. Uh, obviously, uh, induction is not a very simple, uh, it's, a, it's not a simple proof techniques. And uh, when you see this for the first time, I don't think you can get it right. Um, so you need to see multiple times. And also, uh, the homework problems are about exercise uh, problems of induction. Okay, and today's lecture could be important. As you notice, I usually uh, write homework problems based on the lecture materials. So if you don't pay attention to the lectures, you may be having a hard time to do uh, homeworks. If you understand what is going on in the lecture, it should be it's okay. I hope. Um, all right, so uh, let me uh, start with reviewing uh, what is the induction. Um, so mathematical induction, this is about to prove uh, some sentences of the form uh, P of n. So this is not a single sentence because n ranges over all possible values. Usually it ranges over natural numbers, but as you see sometimes, it doesn't start with uh, 1, it may start with 0, or it may start with 3 or 4 or whatever. Okay? So whatever the case is, there's a starting point, and then you uh, do the induction uh, uh, using these base cases. So your goal is to prove P of n for all possible values, uh, so let's say for all possible uh, natural numbers n, then uh, a naive idea is trying to prove P of 1, P of 2, P of 3 separately, uh, but you know this is not easy to do. Okay, but uh, mathematical induction allows us to uh, prove this in a different style. So first write this in terms of the base case, and then some inductive case. Inductive case starts uh, from uh, assuming that P of M is true, then uh, P of M plus 1 is true. So it is written in the style that uh, when you prove uh, each of these uh, uh, second force, uh, third force, all these things, you assume that this is to be true, and then using this assumption you prove uh, P of uh, the next number is true. Okay, so when you prove inductive step, do not worry about whether induction hypothesis is true or false. Okay, the reason is it is established before. So uh, if we know that P of 1 is true as a separate base case, and if you know this is true, okay, even if at this point you didn't know that P of 1 is true, but if you combine the base case with the second formula, then you will derive P of 2 is true. And once you know that P of 2 is true, then using this one and the third formula, you can derive P of 3 is true, and so on and so forth. So you can derive uh, possible, all, all possible values of n, uh, P of n is true. And the key idea here is if the same reasoning applies to these inductive cases, then you can, we can write as a single uh, step, abstracting away all the uh, values of n. Okay? However, as we saw uh, before, uh, actually. So the basic what it means is to prove the case of P, uh, P of m plus 1, you assume that P of m is true, and um, uh, 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 try to prove uh, P of m plus 1 uh, uh, using that assumption. And what is the assumption? Assumption is something that you didn't prove to be true, but you assume that to be true. And for this one, you can only use one induction hypothesis. So if you try to prove the case of P of m plus 1, you can only assume the case just preceding that uh, m plus 1 case, which is m. So you can only assume that P of m is true uh, in, in, uh, when you prove uh, the case of P of m plus 1. So if you want to prove P of 100, then the induction hypothesis should be about P of 99. Okay? So let me make that clear. So the problem. Uh, well, sometimes uh, the induction fails. Uh, we saw some examples like force example, and all famous numbers are given. Uh, the caveat here is sometimes the reasoning is not repeated in all inductive cases. Some part of the uh, uh, steps, uh, P of 1 implies P of 2, or maybe P of 3 implies P of 3, somewhere it may fail to use the same reasoning uh, as in the other cases. Okay? So, when you use induction to prove the whole other cases, except for the base case, the assumption is this one. You have to check whether the same reasoning 
is applied to all inductive cases. Now, notably, in the horse example, not all the steps have the same reasoning. P of 1 implies of P of 2 couldn't have the same reasoning as the other cases because when we have P of 1 implies P of 2, one uh, condition that uh, there are uh, common forces between the two sets is violated. Okay? So that does not work. As well as in the Fibonacci number, uh, which is actually shown uh, in the uh, next uh, uh, course of the induction, uh, some of these steps are actually not working as expected. So in the homework problem, I gave you some tricky questions. Well, not very tricky, but uh, some alleged proof. They try to use induction, but it fails. Okay? So like the Jose example. So um, when you solve those kind of problems, try to instantiate his argument. So like P of 1, P of 1 implies P of 2, and so on and so forth. And see where in the proof uh, this argument uh, breaks. The same reasoning that usually applies to our, all other inductive cases may fail in some particular steps. The next one is causal balance induction. And in this case, you are proving uh, the step P of 1. Um, so that's one case. The second case, P of 1 implies P of 2. The third one is P of 1, and P of 2 is true, then P of 3 is true. Okay? Now from the third the third line here is actually different from the mathematical induction, right? So we assume actually not only the uh, previous uh, preceding number uh, can be assumed, but also uh, all the preceding numbers, not just the one immediate preceding. So we assume that uh, P of 1 and P of 2 are true. From this, you derive P of 3. And same for the other P of 1 and P of 2 and P of 3. And then you try to prove it. The reason that we said here was uh, the first case is actually the same as mathematical induction. If you know the first two formulas, you can derive P of 2. But since P of 2 is true and also P of 1 is true, their conjunction is true. If the conjunction is true and the third formula is true, then we can derive again P of 3. And P of 3 is true, P of 2 is true, P of 1 is true. So all their conjunction is true. With this formula as well as the last formula that is shown here, we can derive P of 4. So if you look at this, we prove P of 1, P of 2, P of 3, P of 4, forever. Okay? Now, this way, this way is a bit more complicated. It looks more complicated than the previous uh, induction. But the nice thing about this uh, proof is how many induction hypotheses that you have. So when you try to prove the case for M, uh, P of M, you can assume that uh, the induction holds for the value of N, value of 2, until the value of M minus 1. So when you try to prove the case of P of M, you can assume n minus 1 induction hypothesis. When you have more hypotheses to play with, there is a better chance that you can prove. Now, uh, the maybe a bit more challenging issue with the causal values induction compared to the mathematical induction is this. Um, not all the proof actually uses all uh, assumptions. Okay, you don't have to use all all assumptions. You can use uh, some assumptions. Okay, P of m minus 1, same as in mathematical induction. Okay, so in that sense, mathematical induction is a special case of course of values induction. You can actually assume the two previous steps, so P of m minus 1 and P of m minus 2. And that was the case that we proved some property about Fibonacci number because the definition of Fibonacci uh, number is defined based on the two preceding uh, uh, numbers, right? So f of n is equal to f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2, when n is greater than or equal to 2. So in that case, it is actually good to use two induction hypotheses, which you couldn't do with mathematical induction, because mathematical induction, you can only use one induction hypothesis. So if you try to prove the case of p of n, you can only use p of n minus 1, but that is not enough for the Fibonacci number. Okay? Um, so that's one thing, uh, a bit uh, 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 thinking is required to use causal values induction. You can still use one induction hypothesis, but you can actually use not just the preceding one, you can use maybe three steps uh, before. So if you try to prove P of M, causal values induction allows you to use the P of M minus 3. 
Okay? And that you will see very useful soon uh, in the uh, proof exercise today. Another thing is uh, you have to check whether the same reasoning applies to all these inductive cases. Now, mathematical induction, uh, also you, you have to check it. But for the course of variance induction, uh, this is more serious. Okay? So you will see in many times that some of the initial segment of the proof is not using the same uh, reasoning. Okay? So you may have to separate these as different cases. Okay. So you are proving the same as uh, a formula. Okay, so this formula Q of n uh, up to Q of n minus 1 implies Q of n. You are proving the same formula, but you may have to split the cases when you uh, use causal variance induction. We'll see the, uh, an example soon. Okay? Um, and sometimes when these separate cases are not carefully checked, the induction fails. In fact, maybe the uh, claim itself is false. Okay? So this was what I said before. To prove P of M, you can assume all the assumptions here, P of 1 through uh, P of N minus 1, but uh, you'll have to use that. Okay? You can use it, but you don't have to use it. Now, to prove this one, we actually use two induction hypotheses, which was this one and this one. Okay, any question up to this point? This is the review of the uh, last uh, uh, lecture. Okay. So if not, then let's do more exercises. By the way, uh, the TA should have gone through more uh, induction uh, exercise in the resource intersection. So that should be also something that you have to uh, practice by yourself, whether you can prove this by, your, uh, uh, by yourself without uh, looking at the solution. So uh, why do we care about the induction in computer science? Uh, there are actually many uses of induction. I actually use induction heavily. Um, my dissertation, I also use induction for some chapter. Um, unfortunately, teaching the uh, induction, use of induction in computer science to this level of class may be hard because you need additional knowledge about the uh, structure of hardware and software and logic and formal language. But let me ask, uh, just mention uh, some examples uh, so maybe you can relate it uh, later uh, in the course. So one uh, uses uh, software and hardware verification. So when you uh, 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 learn like operating system, you want to see that whether the resources are fairly used. Okay. So whether there is no deadlock, so no uh, uh, processor can no process can uh, continue to roll. How do you check that this system will not have deadlock? Okay. You can prove this by induction. You can think about the uh, uh, particular. Uh, state of the system, and when you execute some instruction in a uh, uh, computer, that state changes to another state. And the induction tells you that uh, uh, when you transition to another state, um, you will never reach into the deadlock state if your software design or hardware design is correct. Okay, so you can use induction for that kind of thing. Uh, and many times, this kind of induction involves about thousand cases to split because modern computers are very sophisticated. So we usually don't use our hand, but we can use some software to check this induction. There are some software, some theory improvers uh, that check the induction. Uh, automated planning. So this is about uh, an area of AI where you want to find a robot to uh, execute some sequence of actions to reach a goal. Um, when there is a goal, then robot will find a plan, but how do you know that this uh, uh, goal cannot be reached, no matter how many steps that you do? Okay, that can be proven by induction. Uh, rule learning, this is uh, inductive logic programming, where the idea is from the data, the data is all raw numbers, so uh, it's just uh, some sensor data and any uh, nonsensical uh, uh, numbers. But can you actually infer the meaning of the uh, data? Can you extract the rules from the data? That uses induction. Uh, formal language and number theory. Actually, if you go to 355, there are many of the inductive uh, step of proof, uh, like uh, proof of pumping data. Uh, and many uh, properties of formal language uses uh, induction. Okay? And number theory, like Fibonacci number that we spoke about, a lot of numbers are defined recursively, and many of the recursive definitions uh, use uh, the 
uh, induction. Okay. So if you go to graduate school, you may even have a class, uh, one uh, course that, that that is dedicated to induction. So in the whole semester, you're only learning induction. Okay, so we are not at that stage yet, but uh, there's some uh, non-trivial question that we want to consider. So here is a claim. So for all uh, values n, so we are going to create a postage of n cent, uh, where you can use only 3 cent stamps and 5 cent stamps. And from this, uh, can we generate all possible uh, stamps uh, that is greater than or equal to a cent. So how can we do? So let's <coughs> see, um, can we create like n equals eight? Okay, how do we create n cent positive or a cent positive using three cent and five cent? Stamp. So that is uh, 8. So we can create 8 cent postage. That's good. What about n equals uh, 9? How do we create 9 cent postage? 3 plus 3 plus 3. Okay. So that seems to be working. Okay. So 3 plus 3 plus 3 is 9. What about 10? Hmm? 5 plus 5, okay. What about 11? 3 plus 3 plus 5, okay. What about 12? Hmm? 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3. Okay, so you see that it works for P of 8, P of 9, P of 10, so it will be proof, right? Right? Do you agree? Okay. It seems a good proof to you. So we proved it, right? So we showed that for all possible values of n, we can create our n cent postage because we showed that this works. And if you write this way in your test or homework, you will get zero point, exactly zero point. Okay, I promise you, I will never give any credit for the one who write. This is the correct proof. Okay. So enumerating the cases is never proof for this kind of argument. So you have to prove for all values of n that this should be true. But we only show five cases. But how many numbers are there that is greater than or equal to a? This is many. So we didn't do that. So we have to use induction. So let's use induction then. Okay. All right. So how do we prove? So proof is by course of values induction. So induction hypothesis tells us that for any k, so don't hear that the k actually starts from a. So the induction is not starting from 1, okay, unlike the previous example, but we said this is okay. So induction hypothesis tells us that for any k such that k should be still greater than a because that's where the induction starts. But if k is less than m, Okay, since this number k is less than m that we want to prove, by course of values induction that p of k should hold. Okay? So we say that for any k such that uh, k is sti uh, smaller than m, we assume by induction hypothesis that uh, this is possible. Now the next step. Among the many values of k, so we want to prove whether we can create m cent postage. And by course of values induction, that allows us to assume p of a minus 1, p of a minus 2, p of a minus 3, and so on and so forth are true. Right? Which, which means, in particular, when k equals m minus 3, 
Okay? By induction hypothesis, we know that there is a way to uh, form the k and postage. Okay? This is by induction hypothesis because k is less than m. So suppose somebody tells you, I create a k set postage, which where k is m minus 3. Okay? Okay? So I give you the postage that is k minus uh, uh, k cent, which is n minus 3 cent uh, postage. How can you create m cent postage using that? <laughs> how, how do you create? So I, I just give you, I don't need to show you, but uh, here is the uh, n minus 3 cent postage. Okay, you can use 3 cent and 5 cent stamps. Can you create m cent postage? Add one three cent stamps, right? Because somebody gave you m minus three cent postage, and you have to create m cent postage. Then just add one three cent uh, stamp. So, so take that and add the three cent stamp, which will make the postage of m cents. <coughs> Convincing? Yes. Uh, let's say postage of 15 cent. Suppose I have to do that. Okay? I, I want to create a postage of 15 cent postage. Now, somebody gives me 12 cent postage. Right? Then can I create 15 cent postage? I can do that by adding one 3 cent stamps, right? And you're asking how do you create 12 cent postage? Because that we have three cent postage, three cent stamps. So if somebody gives me n minus three, I can always make n cent postage by adding one three cent stamp. So that's why I, yeah, I chose y n minus three. If I chose n minus two, that doesn't work, right? N minus four doesn't work. But if I have n minus three, then if I'm given n minus three cent postage, I just add one three cent stamp, I can make. I could actually do this in a, uh, the other way. So I can create. So if somebody give me m minus five cent postage, then I can add one five cent stamp, then there's m cent postage. That, that's also another way to go. Okay? Yes. So we can where induction hypothesis we do k equals m minus the smallest unit of change. Mm -hmm. Like as a, as a, like I don't have to create the smallest, but I could have used the other one. Any units of change. Right? Okay. Very okay. so confusing, right? This is actually false. And I don't know, maybe um, this is actually wrong proof. Wrong, wrong proof. And probably you don't have any idea yet. So let me actually show you a different uh, claim. And we'll come back to this one. So this is the same problem as the previous one. The change here is instead of 8, I subtract this uh, 6. So and, uh, 6 cent or more uh, cent uh, postage uh, can be created by using 2 cent and 4 cent uh, stamps. OK? So let's uh, see how the proof goes. OK? So proof by cause of values induction. Well, induction hypothesis tells me if I want to prove that I can create the m cent postage, I can assume that I can create a, a, a k cent postage where k is less than m, right? So same as before, right? And in particular, now I will take m minus 2. Okay? So let's take m minus 2. I know for some reason that somebody can give me m minus 2 cent postage. Then, uh, actually, by the induction hypothesis, we can create a k cent postage. Okay? Now take that and add one uh, two cent stem, then m minus two plus two equals m, so I created m cent uh, postage. So according to the causal values induction principle, the claim is proven. Convincing, right? Because there's nothing different from the previous one, except for some small number changes, right? Right? Okay. So can we create uh, 
n cent for c using two and four cent stamps. So let's see six. How do we create six? Yeah, you can have two plus four or two plus two plus two. You can do that. Okay, so that may be fine. So you can create n equals six, huh? two plus four. Left, okay, so one two cent stamp and one uh, four cent stamp. How about n equals seven? problem, the numbers are so small, so we can easily see how many times that you apply many different stamps, you cannot get this case. So we know that this is false. Now, the claim was about for all values of n, but we found one single example so far that this claim is false. Okay? So this kind of example is called a counterexample. And to disprove the claim, you only need one counterexample, you don't need more than that. Because this is obviously false. But then the question is, what was going on in the proof? Okay, so it seems we are using the uh, valid reasoning of induction, right? So what so what, what is induction saying? Okay, so let's go back. What uh, was the cause of values induction was to say? And you probably will get this hint when I show this again. Right? So, I told you to uh, prove this. So, Q1. So, when you prove the case of Q of M, so if you are creating an uh, M cent postage, you can assume all the preceding cases. So, in the first example, with 5 and 3 cent steps, we were using P of M minus 3. Assume that m minus three cent postage can be made, then we can create m cent postage. So that seems to be fine, right? According to the induction principle, we were using p of m minus three as the induction hypothesis and proof uh, p of m. What is wrong with that? And for the same thing, uh, for the two and four cent steps, we were using p of m minus two as induction hypothesis. From there, we use uh, we prove uh, p of m. What's wrong with that? Maybe the textbook is wrong. OK, so let me give you some time to think about. And let me actually give you um, maybe this problem. This problem is a bit easier than the previous problem, OK? although. Syntactically, they are almost identical. So let me open the Socrative and find out what is wrong here. You can talk with your neighbor if you want.
Okay, let's see. All right, pretty close. Let's open the result. A few people didn't submit. Okay, let me try to close now. One more person has to finish. Okay, so let's look at uh, the statistics. Okay, so according to the statistics, um, well, that's not majority, means more than half. So 20, 30%, 28%. So it looks like C and E seems to be dominant as well as B and A. So it's not really demonstrative. Okay, let's see what is going on. Okay. So, Let's compare the two uh, proof, and as you see, the proof is identical except for the numbers. So the numbers actually matter. Okay. Uh, something that I ask you to do as a hint when we start uh, when we review the uh, induction, we're trying to instantiate this argument. Okay, don't take it as just n or n minus one as method. Try to uh, uh, write the instances of those m. And let's see how it goes. So this was the claim. The first thing, of course, you have to do is, what is the mathematical sentence that you want to prove? Uh, so you have to identify what is p of m. Okay, in the homework, I uh, uh, usually ask you to uh, uh, state clearly what is p of m that you want to prove, okay? So for this problem, p of m is a sentence that can be either true or false. And the sentence is saying it's possible to produce m cent of postage using two cent and four cent stamps. Okay? This P of M, okay, is a declarative sentence. Okay? That can be either true or false. Okay? Although it's actually false. Okay? Now, if we are trying to use course of values induction, what are we showing? We are showing this form. P of 6, because induction starts from 6, and when n equals 6. Okay, so if you are trying to prove the case for P of m, assume, uh, assume uh, that all the preceding cases can be done. So when you try to uh, create n set postage, by cause of values induction, you can assume that n minus 1 set postage can be created, n minus 2 cent postage can be created, up to 6 cent postage can be created. These are the assumptions that you can use. Okay? So, let's try to instantiate this. So by instantiation, I'm checking this with respect to each possible value of m. Okay? Because I said, I told you before, that even if this is one uh, line, uh, maybe the if, uh, 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 each uh, some for some values of m, we may use different reasoning. And in that case, you cannot claim as one inductive step. So let's see, m equals six. P of six. Is it true? So we have to prove p of six, right? Because uh, when you try to prove P of 6, this is empty, right? So there's no preceding number that is less than 6 and starting from 6. There's no uh, such cases. So there's no induction time for sentence that you can use. So you have to prove P of 6 directly. Is P of 6 true? Yes. How do we know? We can just show it. We can use 2 cent and 4 cent stamps, so we can do that. M equals 7. 
Now, if you look at n equals m, there's an interesting thing going on. The statement here is instantiated to be this way. How many induction hypotheses do you have? One. This is induction hypothesis. This is the conclusion that you want to draw. And for this time, you can use induction hypothesis for here of six, which means in English it is possible to produce six cent stems using two cent and four cent stems. From this, can you create seven cent postage? Knowing that you can create six cent uh, postage, does that help you to show that seven cent postage can be made? Does not work. Somebody asked the question, why n minus three? Because we have three cent stamps. We don't have one cent stamps, so even if you can make, even if P of six is true, even if this is true, okay, you cannot add two cent stamps to create seven cent uh, postage, right? Even if somebody gives you six cent postage, Adding two or four cent stamps there doesn't make seven cent postage. This is false. The reasoning here, okay? So going back to the previous sentence, what was going on here? Uh, Okay, let's look at this one. So we are looking at m equals seven case. Suppose m equals seven, okay? The part B, you're saying that k equals five, right? If m equals seven that you want to prove, then k is five. And line C is saying, by the induction hypothesis, there is a way to form 5 cent postage. However, induction hypothesis is starting from 6, and n equals 6. It doesn't cover n equals 5. We do not get P of 5. Let's go back. If we want to apply the same reasoning, what could have been helpful is not P of 6. We need induction hypothesis to be P of 5. If you can create 5 cent postage, then you can create 7 cent postage. But according to the course of variance induction that start with n equals 6, we cannot assume P of 5. P of 5 is not upon your hand. In fact, this is the case that uh, uh, the reasoning fails. Okay? Even if you can create six cent postage, which happens to be true in this problem, it does not help you to create seven cent postage. The reasoning that you create n minus two cent postage uh, and then add two cent stem, that does not hold, uh, hold for this step. Are we together? This is a bit tricky, okay? but hopefully you can understand. Because one of the former problems is about the post, uh, postage problem. Okay. So this is the failing case. What about the other cases? So when n equals eight, that means you have n equals eight. So this means p of six and p of seven. So we have two induction hypotheses. Among them, I'm going to use only p of six. Okay? So P of 6 means assume 6 cent postage can be made. And can we create 8 cent postage? Yes, just add 1, 2 cent. Okay. What about M equals uh, 9? In this case, I will rely on this one. Okay? So we assume that 7 cent postage can be made, and we can create 9 cent postage. Done. And this reasoning go on forever. Except for the case when m equals 7, where we couldn't use 
P of 5 has induction hydrostasis because induction starting from induction start from 6. So the answer to previous question is C. C is false. You cannot create K and position. That's not by induction hypothesis when m equals 7. All right, so, OK. Any question? Yes. So even though in line b, that's when you're subtracting 2 from k to be less than 6, it's still occurring. Yeah, that's just a equation number, right? It's arithmetic, so you can take off three or four, uh, two from the number. That doesn't make any difference. The the uh, wrong claim. Going back to this one, the wrong. So I mean, here k equals uh, five is fine, but this is the problem. The C okay, doesn't say that you can create a postage of five cents. Induction hypothesis does not cover the case when a, uh, k equals 5 because it starts from 6. Okay, so going back to this thing. Okay, so induction hypothesis starting from 6 doesn't have to be 5. Okay, so all right. Uh, let's look at this one. So, so when uh, m equals 6, we can create it. When uh, uh, m equals 7, we know that p7 is false because there's no way to form it. While in case 3, when m is greater than equal to 8, the inductive step itself is fine. Because if you assume that p of m minus 2 is true, note here that m here starts from a. In that case, k starts from m minus 2, right? So which means k starts from 6. So when m equals a, k is 6, which is covered by induction hypothesis. Okay? So you can create, say, 6 cent postage, and you can add 1, 2 cent stamp to make a cent stamp. That is fine, starting from a. If m equals 9, you can create 7 cent postage, and induction hypothesis covers that, so you're fine. When m equals 10, okay, assume p of a is true, that is also covered because in the induction hypothesis, you can assume it and add two cents step. So this one plus two is 10, we are done. Okay, the only problem is here. When p seven cent postage, when you create seven cent postage, you cannot assume that five cent postage can be made because that's not covered by the induction hypothesis. OK. So then, what was going on with this guy? So same as before, proving this for when n equals greater than equal to a, OK? It's proving this case. So assume starting from p of a, p of 9, up to p of m minus 1. Let's assume that these are all true. Then we can create m cent postage. Again, try to instantiate this. When m equals 8, so when m equals 8 here, um, m equals 8 here, right? This is empty, right? So you have to prove p of 8 directly. When m equals 9, Okay, a, so this induction hypothesis go from a to m minus one. So m minus one is uh, uh, eight. So you can use one induction hypothesis when m equals nine. When m equals 10, you can assume starting from eight up to uh, one less than 10. So you can assume these two induction hypotheses. When m equals 11, you can use p of eight 9, 10 can be created. When m equals 12, you can assume that 8 cent or 9 cent or 10 cent or 11 cent uh, stamps can be made. Good. 
So again, what is wrong with this proof? Uh, the, the, uh, the proof that we uh, saw. So if we create, say, uh, nine centimeters. According to that claim, what was assumed to be true? P of 6, right? So 6 cent postage can be made, then we can add 1, 3 cent time, so we can make 9. But the induction doesn't tell you that you can use P of 6 because it's not part of the induction hypothesis. doesn't tell you that P of 7 is true. It could be true, but induction itself does not say that P of 7 is true. What about this case, P of 11? P of 11 and minus 3 is 8. Oh, this is fine. From this on, there's no problem, because once m equals 11, I can assume that m minus 3 sent postage can be made. That's one of the induction hypotheses. When m equals 12, I can say p of 9 is true, so that's fine, and so on and so forth. We are happy starting from m equals 0. The only problem is when m equals 10, 9, 8, induction hypotheses do not help us. Would yes. you be able to just uh, manually do yes. the So that's a separate case that we have to prove, OK? So induction does not cover, doesn't mean that it is they make another way to prove it. Okay? So here is the correct proof. I told you, we are still proving the same formula as you see here, but for each of the, sometimes you have to split the cases. Okay? Because sometimes induction does not cover. So P of A, to uh, find A cent postage can be made, uh, we cannot use induction hypothesis. It could have been P of 5, but P of 5 is not in the induction hypothesis. Okay, so we have to show manually. How do we find 8 cent postage? Well, 3 plus 5 is 8. That's what we did in the beginning, if you recall. Uh, M equals 9, we actually did that. 3 plus 3 plus 3 is 9. M equals 10, 5 plus 5 equals 10. Until now, we had to separate these cases out. But now, with case when m is greater than or equal to 11, now we can safely use induction hypothesis. Because when m equals 11, then 11 minus 3 is 8, and 8 is allowed to be assumed by induction hypothesis. Okay? This whole thing starts from uh, n equals 8. Okay? So, so case 4, when m is at least 11, then by induction hypothesis, P of n minus 3 is true. Because n minus 3 is greater than equal to 8. Okay, so it is possible to form a postage of n minus 3 cents by induction hypothesis. So you can add 1 3 cent stem that makes m, plus m minus 3 plus 3 is m cent postage. So P of n is done. Okay? So you can easily play with all these numbers. For some numbers, you can create any cent of postage. For some other pairs of stamps, you cannot create uh, any cent uh, postage or any cent. Okay. So try to compare between these two proofs. They look very similar. Okay. Uh, the alleged proof that I showed before. Okay. But the first claim, okay, uh, using three cent and five cent stamps, the claim is actually true, happened to be true. With slight modification, the second problem, two and four cent stamps, the claim is actually false. But if you're not careful in using this induction, you may end up with proving anything is true. Okay, like four cent stamps. Okay, so question up to this part before we move on to different topic now. 
Okay, if not, then let's look at the last topic of this today's course. Um, so we are going to apply causal values induction for propositional formulas. And recall that we have uh, studied this syntax. Okay, so um, maybe this is a good time that you browse all the uh, uh, materials that you learned in the beginning. Um, so uh, every atom is a formula, okay? And uh, atom and top are formulas. And if f is a formula, then uh, this string uh, left and negation f closing parenthesis is a formula. Okay. Or if you have any binary connective like conjunction, disjunction, implication, okay. And if you have a GR formula, then this string is also a formula. This was one of the slides that you saw earlier. I think it was lecture two probably. Okay. So. That was the definition, and the definition is so-called recursive because to prove, to define a formula, we refer to a formula again, right? Now, for this kind of recursive definition, I told you that induction is a good way to prove the property. Okay, so we want to prove some properties for any formula. So one of the maybe trivial proof uh, uh, property of formula is when you take any proposition formula, you will see that there's equal number of left and right parentheses. Right? You can play with some examples like what? Um, how many left parentheses are here? One. How many right parentheses? One. So that's equal, right? If you have. How many left parentheses are here? Three. How many right? Three. So no matter what you call, you see that there are same number of left and right parentheses. So the claim that we want to prove is this. Uh, P of f, so now this induction is not about the numbers, it's about the structure of the formula. Okay? P of f means that the formula f has the equal number of left and right parentheses. How can you prove it? Again, enumeration does not help, right? Because how many formulas are there in the world? infinitely many. You can create many, many different formulas. And you cannot check for each of case that uh, they have same number of left and right parentheses. So that's not possible. Okay. So we are going to prove uh, this by causal values induction. And for the formulas, there is a uh, template for, for the causal values induction. So this template is saying, uh, based on the recursive definition, to prove that it is property P or for any formula F, you need to establish these four cases. First case, when F is an atom, F has that property P. This is kind of base case. You can, use, you can check it without using induction hypothesis. Case two, again, okay, is similar to the first one. So there are two zero place connective, uh, top and bottom. So in that case, uh, those uh, have the same property. From third, uh, the third and fourth bullets are for the inductive cases. So here, if, for, if a formula has property P, okay, then the new formula that can be defined by the third because with uh, bullets, that formula also have the same property P. Fourth one same. Okay. If F and G have property P, then so you assume this as an inductive step, inductive uh, hypothesis. Using that, you show that the new formula, F sum G, also have the same property P. If you show all four cases, then you are done with covering all possible formulas, because any formula can be made using these rules only. So um, I have two class discussion problems for the next time. Uh, which is to use this cause of values induction. So if you want to uh, 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 volunteer for the problems, then you're welcome to do so, as well as there's a homework problem that uses cause of values induction. So let's look at this problem to give you some idea about how to use the induction. Okay? So, so the claim is 
If you take any proposal formula, there's always equal number of left hand right parentheses. Maybe this is too obvious, but it's not that obvious to prove. Okay? So before we prove this, I'm going to introduce the notations. I'm going to say L of F. I use square bracket just to differentiate between the parentheses in the formula. So this is number of left parentheses in the formula F. And same way, I will denote uh, by R of F the number of right parentheses in F. Okay? Okay, so recall the uh, proof cases. So case one is when F is an atom. Okay, so atom is like P, Q, R, right? Okay, so in this case, what is L of F? When F is an atom, how many left parentheses are uh, in there? How many left parentheses are in atom? Zero, okay. So there is no parentheses in atom. So L of F equals zero. What about R of F? How many right parentheses are in the atom? Also, zero. Oh, by the way, I should actually say, what is the claim that we want to prove? The claim here, as in English, can be written as proving P of F, where L of F is equal to R of F. So this is the claim to be proven. Okay. So what did I just show you? Well, if F is an atom, this is this, this triangle, so that's what we wanted to prove. Okay, when F is an atom. Case two, when F is zero place connective, bottom and top, I also want to show the same thing. Okay? And how many left parentheses are in bottom or top? Also zero. So it's actually the same reasoning as before. Okay, so these are the base cases, and that's easy because there are no uh, parentheses in those two cases. What about a case three? So case three is saying that if F has the property P, assuming that F has the property P as an induction hypothesis, prove that parentheses negation F closing parentheses have the same property P. Okay, so. Induction hypothesis is saying that assume uh, L of F is equal to R of F for formula F. Okay, so this is induction hypothesis. Okay, now what we want to prove the goal, let me just copy the goal here, it's not yet proven, but what we want to show is this new formula that pre, uh, precedes uh, the negation, it also has the same number of left and right parentheses. So this is the goal that we want to prove. Okay, note here that this is P of F, and this is P of not F. Okay? So we assume that the property holds for F, and then using that to prove that not F also has the same property. Okay? So this uh, goal is not yet proven. So how do we prove it? So here is something that we can use induction hypothesis. How many left parentheses are in L of this formula? How many parentheses are here. How many parentheses are there? I don't know because I don't know what is F, right? However, I can actually say that the number of left parentheses in F is denoted by L of F, right? So then I can write this as an equation. Okay? 
So the number of lamp parentheses here is this one, right? Plus whatever is in F, whatever left parentheses in F. So this number is 1 plus, 1 denotes the first left parentheses in here, plus L of F. You should understand this, otherwise you cannot follow the rest of the steps. How many of you don't understand the equation that I just wrote? All of you understand? Okay? Yes. You don't? Okay, good. Um, suppose F is an atom. <coughs> How many left parentheses are here? One. One plus zero. zero. Right? Suppose this F has one left parenthesis, then how many left parenthesis are here? Two, because one plus one. If this has n number of left parenthesis, then how many left parenthesis are in the whole string? One plus n, yes. So you know that now. Good. Okay. So that's what I denote by one plus n. So where n is the number of left parenthesis in f. Good. Okay, um, now I claim that this is same as 1 plus R of F. Why? Why 1 plus L of F is equal to 1 plus R of F? How do you know that they are same? Be Just be simple. There's a solution already in the slide. It's from our assumption that LF. Uh, yeah, we already wrote the assumption here. L of F is equal to L of F. Okay? And as well as the uh, other notion of that is, do not worry about whether this is true or false. This is given to you. And this one is simply add one to each side. Okay? In algebra, if you add the same number to both sides, then the resulting equation is still true, right? But why do I write this? It's because this number is same as number of right parentheses in here, okay? Why? The same reasoning applies. The number of right parentheses in the whole string uh, parentheses, negation, F, closing parentheses. How many right parentheses are here? This is not. This is not. But F may contain, say, N right uh, parentheses, followed by another one. So 1 plus N, where N is the number of right parentheses in F. So this equality is true by definition. And this equality is true because this is induction hypothesis. Again, this is the definition of left parenthesis. So what did we prove? If you look at the chain, we proved that this one is equal to this one, which is similar, uh, which is actually the uh, same thing that we wanted to prove. So this P, the property P, also holds for negation of F. So case three is done. Let me actually re re recap what we are doing. So we are, we are using this one. If a formula f has the property p, if f has the same number of left and right parentheses, then now f also has the same number of left and right parentheses. That's what we just showed. So they have the equal number of left and right parentheses. I mean, they are equal number of left and right parentheses in f, and that means L of this new formula, which has one plus whatever the number of left parentheses is in F, is equal to 1 plus R of F, because L of F is equal to R of F by induction hypothesis. And this number is the number of right parentheses in this new formula. So we are done. OK, case four. In case four, if you recall the previous one, we assume this induction hypothesis for two formulas. So we are going to say L of F is equal to R of F. And 
L of G is equal to R of G for formulas F and G. So we are assuming the induction hypothesis for the soft formulas F and G. Now, let's see. What we want to prove is the new formula that uses this uh, binary connective, I use just sum to denote any kind of binary connective, should be equal to the number of right parentheses in the new string. I have to show this, right? So we have to fill this gap, okay? So how many left parentheses are in this formula? Can anyone tell me how many are there? Huh? <laughs> Use the thing that you know, like the previous case. One plus the number of references in F plus number of references in G. So using the notation, we can say that this is L of F, one plus L of F plus L of G, right? I don't have to know what is the exact number. I don't need to know because L of F encapsulates all the number of uh, number of left parentheses in F. So this is the first left parentheses and whatever the number, let's say M plus whatever the number N, that's what I write here. Okay, now you know the trick. L of f is equal to R of f. So I can change this to, uh, uh, instead of L of f, I can write R of f. And I also know that L of f, g equals R of g, so I can write R of g. Right? But then if you look at this number, this is exactly the number of right parentheses in here. Okay? So L of f plus L of g plus the last one. That's the total number of right parentheses in F sum G. So I, we proved that the, all these four cases okay, is true. So by the force of values induction principle, this property is true for all formulas. All right. Um, so I want you to actually go back to this one. Um, the next problems are similar but maybe a bit more uh, complex, but the same idea applies. Um, so the next, prob uh, next time, if you have a solution for these problems, you can write your solution on the board. Uh, here is a notation for the prefix. So when you say a prefix, um, you have like, um, for this kind of uh, formulas, right? So prefix here simply means that uh, any prefix of the string, okay? The mathematical definition is, um, and you have the uh, string a1 uh, uh, dot an, where a i is, each ai represents an alphabet symbol. We are uh, taking any smaller uh, initial uh, characters, okay? So if you have this as your string, how many prefixes are there? The first one is actually empty string, is a prefix, okay? And this is also a prefix, taking only one. Or taking two is also a prefix. Taking three is also a prefix. Taking four, also a prefix. Taking whole is also a prefix. So this formula has one, two, three, four, five, six, six prefixes. So you, you, you get it, right? So prefix is just initial segment. Okay, any initial segment. Now, d5 and d6 is about the properties of the prefix. So if you take any prefix of a formula, for this one, the number of left parentheses is always greater than or equal to the number of right parentheses, right? We can easily check for this example. L of f is 0, r of f is 0. L of f equals 1, r of f equals r of f is 0. So there are more left parentheses. There are more left parentheses, more, more, equal. So at least for all the prefixes, the number of left parentheses, number of left parentheses is at least greater than or equal to the number of right parentheses. How do you prove it? All right. The other one is any prefix or formula is either an empty string or has more left than, than right or 
equal self. So for, uh, for example, these are the old prefixes of that formula. So it, the first one is empty string. The second one, sorry, this one, this one, this one, they all have the more number of left parentheses. While the last one has equal number of left and right parentheses. And it's actually exactly the same as the given formula F. So whatever prefix that you take, you will always see one of these case, three cases will apply. That's what D6 is about. OK, any question about today's material? This is the last one. If not, then let me open this operative.